Mason Peta, aka Mace, would be born in Jacksonville, Florida in August of 1975. While he was born in Florida, he would ultimately end up moving to Harlem, which is a neighborhood in Manhattan, which is a borough in New York City, New York. When Mace moved to Harlem, he would end up getting in a little bit of trouble. This is something that his mother disapproved of and to get him away from this, she would send Mace back to Florida for a while. Eventually, Mace would come back to Harlem when he was a little older and started to become a promising basketball player alongside rapper Cameron at Manhattan Center, which is a public high school in Harlem. In the past, I've done a video detailing the history between Cameron and Mace, which you should definitely go check out. I'll put a link in the description for you guys to go watch. I'll touch on the situation in this video, but in that video, I go further in depth with their situation throughout that video. Mason Cam would end up going to college for basketball. Cameron would drop out of high school, but would eventually get his GED. According to Cameron, the University of Miami put him in a community college in Corsicana, Texas, named Navarro College. This was meant to be temporary due to Cameron being set to transfer to the University of Miami once he was finished at Navarro. This plan would be foiled when Cameron pulled his hamstring and got kicked out of college for pistol whipping someone, which is also according to him. As a result of this, Cam would move back to Harlem. Mace, on the other hand, was unable to make it to Division I colleges due to his bad academic scores. Due to this, he would attend State University of New York at Purchase on a basketball scholarship. This is a Division III school. While Mace attended college, he soon realized that he had a slim chance of actually making it to the NBA. This is when he really started to begin focusing on music. Writing raps, making demo tapes, and performing at local nightclubs were some of the things Mace would do to perfect his craft. But just like Cameron, Mace would drop out of college and land back in Harlem. But he would go back to Harlem before Cam would return from college. To break from the storyline, it should be mentioned that 1993 is when the rap group Children of the Corn is said to have formed. This rap group consisted of Cameron or Killer Cam, Mace or Murder Mace, Bloodshed, Big L, and Herb McGruff. Big L is said to have started their group, but the group would ultimately be disbanded later in the 90s, sometime after the death of Cameron's cousin Bloodshed. Big L would also tragically pass away some years later as well. While Cameron is very important to the backstory of Mace, there's another man that's integral as well. He's known by the name of Cooter Love. This is who Mace would shout out on the song Mo Money Mo Problems. In the song, he would say that Cooter schooled him to the game. Mace's sister would introduce the two while Mace was living with her, and Cuda would eventually become Mace's manager. At the time that he was introduced to Mace, he was the road manager of Biggie Smalls. Upon meeting Mace, Cuda would be impressed with his rapping abilities. During this time, Mace was sleeping on the floor of a one-bedroom apartment in Harlem, splitting the burgers at White Castle. Cooter would sell his Acura so him and Mace could fly to Jack the Rapper, which was a hip-hop convention in Atlanta, Georgia. While in Atlanta, Mace hoped to see the Wu-Tang Clan perform while also looking for the chance to meet Jermaine Dupri. He would attend a party Jermaine Dupri was having, but the bouncers would not let Mace meet Jermaine. At this time, Jermaine Dupri was very big time in the industry. By fate, Mace would bump into Diddy on the dance floor instead. He would rap for Diddy in the middle of the party. This impressed Diddy, who told Mace that when Mace got back to New York, he did not want him to talk to any other labels because Diddy wanted to sign him. Within a week, Mace would sign a Bad Boy Records. Like I said, Mace used to be known as Murder Mace, but under Bad Boy, he would be known as Mace to make him more marketable. For instance, the locks would be a part of Bad Boy Records. Before they were on Bad Boy, they were known as the Warlocks. Diddy had the group change their name upon signing to the label, and their image would also be changed. Bad Boy, at this time, led what many people have called the Shiny Sue era due to the wardrobe their artists wore in music videos. 
before I got signed to Bad Boy, I grew up listening to Snoop and Tupac and my hood was all Tupac driven. I was such a hardcore rapper and then when I got with Puff, he was like, I already got Jadakiss, I already got the locks, I already got Biggie, I don't need any more hardcore rappers. So I was like, so what am I gonna do? They called me Murder Mace. He was like, we gonna lose the murder, we gonna clean you up, we gonna get your hair cut, we gonna take that hoodie off and I was thinking, what would that look like? Mace felt like Diddy was trying to water him down. Mace initially did not want to come off as soft, and this is how Mace used to sound before he signed with Bad Boy. Money be tempting me to jump out the MPB. MP3, clips, all tips with no sympathy. Since 14, I sold morphine for more green. Kept open and order could coat under the drawstring and watched out for caps. Squad cars and beamers and Lartraninas flee the country to Argentina. Lay back in the beach here, coasting with commuters, smoking the Buddhas on the cruise line boat to Aruba for a while, yo. Previously, I mentioned how Mace rapped for Diddy at Jermaine Dupri's party, and it's said by Mace that he would rap what went on to be his verse on the remix to the 112 song, Only You. This song would come out in 1996. The original song with Biggie and 112 would peak at number 13 on the Billboard Hot 100. The remix would not chart on the Billboard Hot 100, but it would still be the world's introduction to Mace and his unique rap style. He's been asked about his rap style, and he refers to himself as being a real laid back guy. He's laid back, but he also can be hyperactive at the same time. What separates him from other rappers in his mind is that rappers can be nonchalant and boring, but that isn't the case with him because he has energy. Many people have said that Mace does not get the credit for how influential his rap style is and how it impacted the game. I can definitely see why people say this because it definitely had an impact and he for sure needs his flowers for that. At the beginning of 1997, Diddy would release Can't Hold Me Down, which was the lead single to his debut album, No Way Out. This song would be huge, with it topping the Billboard Hot 100 for three weeks. At the time, Puff was already a successful songwriter, producer, and record label owner, but he had yet to put out his first solo record. Can't Nobody Hold Me Down would be it. Gary Harris, a music industry vet and Uptown Records founding staff member where Diddy once worked, would say, When Puff put out that first song, Can't Nobody Hold Me Down, it wasn't clear just how important he was going to be as an artist. That he was going to do an album himself that would sell 7 million units. Nobody saw that. Anybody who tells you they did, they're lying, including him. Years later, Mace would speak about this album in an interview on Rap Fix Live. We just put our heads together and Puff said he was going to be the artist. I stayed in the studio, helped write, and he came up with the records. He wanted to do the records that I wrote and he just started rapping on them. And then he said, I'm going to put you on the record with me. So that's how it happened. Everything I had for myself that was like my demo, that became his album. 1997 proved to be a year of the highest highs and lowest lows for Bad Boy Records. While the label started off hot in January, just a few months later, tragedy would strike. Biggie Smalls would pass away in March of that year. He would tragically be shot and killed. His passing would leave a huge void on Bad Boy's roster due to him being their flagship artist. The Locks and Mace were being looked at as being the young lions of the label. With the top artist passing away, someone needed to fill that void and it ended up being Mace. After Big died, we were searching to see who was going to carry the torch. Everybody would have had the right to get out of contracts because of the violence. Instead, we rolled together. If I had a verse or beat that was better for you, i just give it up. My verses on Pup's first few singles from No Way Out were records I wrote in that one bedroom apartment in Harlem before I even got to the label. I gave them the Puff because he was the one with the hot hand. Now recently, Mace has been getting a lot of attention due to him talking about the effects of what happened after the death of Biggie and how it affected him and others on Bad Boy. I'm not really going to get into that in this video due to me really focusing on the music side of things. 
While losing Biggie was a devastating blow, I don't think anybody expected how well Bad Boy managed to stay afloat in large part due to the success of Diddy's debut album. Just a few months after Biggie's passing would come the release of Diddy's debut album, No Way Out, in July of 1997. This album would peak at number one, selling 561,000 copies in its first week. By the end of the year, the album went quadruple platinum, meaning that it has sold over 4 million copies. Multiple singles would be pushed for the album, which helped to achieve this. One of these singles is the song Been Around the World, which features Mace. This song would peak at number two. Another hit single that Mace would appear on this year would be Mo Money Mo Problems, which was from Biggie's Life at the Death album. This song would top the Billboard Hot 100 chart for two weeks. According to Mace, he came up with the song and the beat. He was the one who told Stevie J, who produced the track, how to do the beat. Mace was everywhere at this point, all over the Billboard Hot 100 charts. He had hits on the radio, and he was in music videos that played all day long on TV. From the beginning of 1997 to the fall of that year, Mace went on a crazy run with his features on classic songs. Two more songs of note is his verse on the Bad Boy remix of Mariah Carey's song Honey and his verse on Brian McKnight's song You Should Be Mine. This song peaked at number 17 on the Billboard Hot 100. Mace was hot as fish grease and now it was his time to show the world what he could do on his own. The world would truly find out in mid-October when Mace released Feel So Good, which was the lead single to his debut album, Harlem World. What you know about going out, head west, red legs, TVs, all up in the head rest. Feel So Good will peak at number 5 on the Billboard Hot 100. This would bring Mace a lot of relief due to his expectations to perform well, especially after Biggie's passing. Initially, Mace did not like the beat to this song and wrote his verse for another beat, but this would be changed and we ended up getting the song that we have today. A few weeks after the release of Feel So Good came the release of Mace's debut album, Harlem World. This album would top the Billboard 200 charts, selling over 175,000 copies in its first week. By the end of the year, the album went double platinum. At the end of 1997, Mace released the second single for the album, which was What You Want. This song ended up peaking at number 6 on the Billboard Hot 100. 24 Hours to Live would not chart, but Looking At Me would peak at number 8 on the Billboard Hot 100. Harlem World was a hell of a debut for Mace. He not only went double platinum by the end of the year, but three of his singles for Harlem World peaked in the top 10 of the Billboard Hot 100. As crazy as this year was, it would be the peak of his commercial success as we would see. It's kind of crazy how his rookie year ended up being the biggest year of his entire career. 1998 would come around and Mace did feature on some hits, but he was not on the same level as he was in 1997. He would feature on the song Take Me There, which peaked at number 14 on the Billboard Hot 100. At the end of the year, he would feature on the 112 song Love Me, which peaked at number 17 on the Billboard Hot 100. There would be a song that Mace did feature on this year that would end up deeply affecting his personal life. This feature was on Cameron's song, Horse and Carriage. The song would peak at number 41 on the Billboard Hot 100. Horse and Carriage is notable because it would spark the feud between Mace and Cameron. Like I already said in the past, I've gone in depth with this entire situation, so watch that video that I recommended if you want to know both sides of the story. But the big thing that Mace was trying to get off the ground in 1998 was his record label All Out Records through Jermaine Dupri's So So Deaf Records. Mace would sign the rap group Harlem World, which consisted of his sister, Baby Stace, Blinky Blink, Cardan, Huddy, Mino, Sugar J, and Loon. Mace said that he handpicked every member of the group. In March of 1999, the group would release their debut album, The Movement. It was originally supposed to be titled Harlem World The Movie. 
the movement would peak at number 11 on the Billboard 200. I Really Like It would be the lead single of the album. The album did manage to go gold a month after it was released. Sadly, this would be the only album from Harlem World and the group would ultimately disband. Also in April, Mace would drop a bombshell with the announcement of his retirement. I got my man Mace on the phone. What's up, baby? I'm chilling, Flex. I feel mad good. I gotta let um, a fact today from Magic Johnson Music. It says Mace is retiring from the rap game. I gotta do what make me happy. You know, a lot of people gonna say I'm crazy. I'm leaving money behind and a lot of things. But it's just, you know, how I feel in my heart. Once God puts something in your heart, you know, God talks to everybody different. So you say you don't want to make any more albums? I don't want to make no records. I don't want to rap on no records. And I don't want to run no record companies. I don't think people want that, Mace. You might be outvoted. What you going to do? <laughs> if I'm outvoted, then I'm just outvoted. You know what I'm saying? Like, I feel as though, like, you know, like the late, great Tupac and people like Biggie, they got the same messages. They just didn't act on it. So when you look at it in that realm, it's like, whoa. I appreciate you calling, Big Daddy. You mind I appreciate you making a call. First off, huge, ginormous, huge pause, Funk Flex. Big Daddy? Hey, yo, hey, yo. Hey, crazy, man. I cannot even lie. <laughs> crazy, crazy. But Mace would further say that he never planned to be in the rap game for long. He wanted to use music as a stepping stone. He wanted to stop rapping to better his life and that not all money is the best thing for your life. A lot of times people are rich, but they're very unhappy. Mace felt like he was happier when he wasn't doing music. This left everyone completely shocked, including Diddy. Mace would tell Diddy that he wanted out of the music industry, in which Diddy thought that Mace was tripping, but ultimately, he respected his decision. It was cited that Mace wanted to follow God and go the religious route. What some people fail to mention is that Mace was around 24 years old when he made this decision. It definitely caught people off guard because this announcement was only a couple months before Mace's sophomore album was due to be released. Despite its lack of promotion, Double Up would release in June of 1999. The album managed to sell 350,000 copies in its first week, peaking at number 11, which is crazy because to sell that many and go number 11, crazy, crazy. But by July, the album would go gold. The very next month in August, Mace would enroll as a freshman at Clark Atlanta University in Atlanta, Georgia to pursue a bachelor's degree in mathematics. While attending, it's been said that he largely downplayed his past as a successful rapper. People have speculated why Mace wanted to leave his successful rap career for the church. In the eyes of the people, he had the money, cars, jewelry, and the girls. What more can someone want? In a QA in 2021, Mace would talk about how he became born again. He detailed that he felt like he was walking millions of people to hell through his music. Before he became born again, a lady would walk up to him while he was in church and say that he was blessed and that he should be born again. At this time, Mace was a rap superstar. He proceeded to reach in his pocket and pull out a wad of money. Mace then told the lady that he was already blessed. Looking back on it, Mace realizes that he was not blessed and that he thought he was blessed because he had all that money. He would be attending this church with a couple of friends when he was told that if he was to go up to the altar, his friends would follow him and listen to his words. Something in his head told him to go to the altar. As he went to the altar, he took off all of his jewelry. A man would come pick up his items and inform Mace that God did not want his money. This experience would change Mace's life and would lead him to his decision to retire from the music industry. 
With his new life, things were not all peaches and cream though. In this early time of his transition, he struggled very bad with his celibacy. It's been said that at the height of Mace's career, he always kept a few girls around him. The ladies loved Mace. While struggling with his celibacy, he would keep rocks in his pocket to remind him of his journey. Jonathan Carter, the pastor of the church that Mace went to, would say, when he got to Siloam, he was broken. He didn't know anything about the Christian world. The first way to come to humility is through brokenness. He was broken empty. He was ostracized by the people who used to be there with him. Mace would soon take beginner's classes planning his own ministry. In December of 2000, Jonathan Carter would ordain Mace, which basically means to make someone a priest or minister. In this case, Mace was an ordained minister. Around this time, he would also get married to his now ex-wife who he met through the church. There was a lot of change in Mace's life and he really changed up his act. For a point in time, he only listened to gospel music and even contemplated with the idea of pursuing a career in gospel music. Basically, he planned to do a Kanye before Kanye. Kind of funny considering that Kanye was heavily influenced by Mace and worked with him before he was ever a household name. But Mace went from performing in sold out arenas to delivering sermons in elementary schools. He was at peace with this and finally in 2001, Mace founded a non-denominational movement called SANE Ministries which stands for Saving a Nation Endangered. Non-denominational basically means to be open or accepting to people of any Christian denomination. In 2003, Mace caused a stir due to his book Revelations, There's a Light After the Lime. In this book, he would detail his rise to fame, his time in the spotlight, and his decision to follow a path lit by God. I said it caused a stir because Cameron felt like Mace was putting people's business in the streets. He was putting people's names in the book from Harlem. The problems would continue to brew between them, but in 2004, Mace would shock the rap game again by coming back. We all know that rappers usually do not go all the way through with retirements, but with Mace, for a lot of people, it felt like after Double Up, he was officially done. In the past, Mace denounced his past music and lifestyle. It shocked a lot of people when he planned to make a comeback. In May of 2004, Mace would release Welcome Back, which was the lead single to his comeback album of the same name. I think this is a great song, one of my favorite May songs actually. The song Welcome Back will end up peaking at number 32 on the Billboard Hot 100. During the build up to the album, Mace would be frequently asked about why he came back to music and what did his congregation think of all this. His response would simply be that a congregation is supposed to follow their leader. The album Welcome Back would drop in August, peaking at number 4 on the Billboard 200 charts, selling 188,000 copies in its first week. It would manage to go gold less than a year later. There did manage to be another successful single off of the album, which was Breed Stretch Shake. This is another song from Mace that I love a lot as well. While people can say whatever they want about Mace coming back to rap, the Welcome Back album was clean. From my knowledge, the album didn't even have a parental advisory sticker on it. While this ended up being Mace's last album to date, it would not spark the end to his venture back into music. 2005 is when people really started to look at Mace a type of way due to his affiliation with G-Unit. He would infamously appear in 50 Cent's music video for his song, Window Shopper. This would not be it because Mace was actively running around with the G-Unit crew. Some people think that he was signed to G-Unit, which was actually not true because Mace still had obligations with Bad Boy Records. I can admit that it did look like Mace was signed to G-Unit because he was appearing in videos with 50 Cent, had a mixtape on G-Unit radio called Crucified for the Hood, appeared on a double XL cover in 2006 with G-Unit, etc. It's kind of a big mess why Mace did not officially sign with G-Unit though. Basically, Diddy wanted 50 Cent to pay $2 million for Mace and 50 Cent just was not having it. I was like, what you looking for for that? He said 2 million. 
I'm like, Mace ain't worth 2 million with 2 million in his pocket. Are you crazy? This is right before we went on that G-Unit tour. The principle is more important. He was a million over what debt was supposed to make. He could have made a million dollars out of it, but he's saying 2 million. We could have did it for the million dollars. He could have got that back. Not only did people have a problem with a pastor like Mace being affiliated with a gangster rap group like G-Unit, but they also were not feeling the subject matter in his music. In his time running with G-Unit, he was rapping about shooting people, pouring Hennessy on women, calling women out of their name, smoking, and a bunch of other stuff that he was rapping about, seemingly contradicting himself. But Mace has addressed these criticisms. I know one of the times was years later in 2017 when he visited Angie Martinez's show. If I take water and I put it in a freezer, it becomes ice. If it comes from the sky, it could be snow or rain. Each time, it's becoming something different in a different element, but it is still water. It's still water. So if you put me in this element, I have to be that to these people. If I go home, I'm not a rapper or pastor. I'm a husband. If I go with my children, I'm a dad. I'm not lying because now I'm with my child playing baseball and being loving. I don't need to be that. The guy who works for a cable company, but he's a Christian, and he sells these kinds of stations. He's not less godly because he's doing an honest job and making an honest living. And you're saying I'm wrong for making an honest living. So if I make millions doing music, it's wrong because he's this. And if the church paid me hundreds of thousands, people are mad because they're saying, why is he taking money from the church? Any way I go, a person who wants to have a problem with it could have a problem with it. This stint with G-Unit would not be that long due to 50 not being willing to sign Mace for what Diddy was offering. I do have a whole video explaining the problems between Mace and Diddy, which I'll also put a link in the description too. It details the problems that they've had throughout the years. I made it before Mace and other bad boy artists were finally given their publishing back. After 2007, there was a lot of talk from various people about Mace dropping another album, but he ultimately never did. There were talks in 2007 of Mace signing two SRC records with Steve Rifkin, but this never came into fruition. Then in 2009, the death of Michael Jackson would inspire Mace to make a comeback, but still no album. He did release a mixtape though, with that being the I Do The Impossible mixtape, which was released in 2009. This mixtape would not be received well, which resulted in Mace deleting his then Twitter account and once again going on another hiatus from music. He wouldn't return until 2012 when he announced on Hot 97 that he was making a comeback. The very next year in 2013, he would announce Now We Even, which was set to be his next album. He's promoted this throughout the years, but it still has yet to come out. Come 2014, there started to be reports of people within Mesa's church being unhappy with him seemingly living a double life. TMZ would report that members of his church disapproved of him spending as much time in the studio with hardcore rappers rather than being in the church. They would further say that his messages from the pulpit were filled with hypocrisy because what he rapped about was the exact opposite. I will say that there are two hilarious stories about Mace and his church on YouTube from Dormtainment that I highly recommend you to go watch. If these are indeed true, it makes it all the more hilarious. Ultimately, in 2021, Pastor Mace would return as he would be named the pastor of Gathering Oasis Church in Atlanta. Not that long after this, Mason Cameron would finally patch up their problems and eventually will go on to create one of my favorite shows to watch, which is It Is What It Is. A very entertaining show and it's good to see that the two are back on good terms. Mace has still been trying to get back in music with him last year in 2022 going as far as to say that he wanted to sign with Death Row Records which is insane if you know the history between Bad Boy and Death Row. Of course Snoop Dogg has since taken over but still. This is pretty much where we're at now. Mace has a very unique and interesting story. He went from Murder Mace to Mace to Pastor Mace back to Murder Mace and so on.
while Mace has quite a controversial career, I would like to say that Mace has an undeniable legacy. When Bad Boy was thought to be in shambles after Biggie died, it was him that really carried the torch, not only as a solo artist, but what many people don't acknowledge is his pen because he wrote a lot of stuff as well. Mace was everywhere in 1997. Harlem World is an undeniable classic too. He had everything that it took to be a superstar. The look, charisma, talent, and work ethic. All the traits that you can think of. He already had what many people dreamed of, but he wanted to leave the game at the height of his success. Even after he initially retired, he would constantly be referenced in songs. Some notable people who referenced him would be Kanye West, Nas, Jay-Z, Cameron, Diddy, Beanie Siegel, and many more. I think that the most notable references about Mace were from Kanye though. On his debut album, The College Dropout in 2004, he would reference a situation that occurred between Ghostface Killer and Mace. Years later on his album, My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy in 2010, he would rap about how Mace screwed up by leaving the rap game when he was hot. Kanye did end up apologizing to Mace for this line in 2020, saying that Mace is one of his favorite rappers and he based a lot of his flows from him. Being influential is something that Mace does not really get the credit for, but he is. He did really change the game and managed to do a lot in the little amount of time that he had during his initial run. I firmly believe that everything happens for a reason. We can always think what if something happened or didn't happen and what if Mace never retired. We could speculate about these things, but it just was not meant to be. He felt that he needed to step away in 1999 and that's exactly what happened. Despite everything, Mace remains a rap legend and is deserving of his flowers for his contributions to the music. His era on top is something people still discuss and reminisce about today. All in all, I would like to thank everyone who watched until the end of the video. With this video, I did not really want to go in depth and do a full documentary on Mace's career. I really just focused on the meat and potatoes while also trying to go in detail about his involvement with the church. I plan to redo Cameron's story, so definitely look out for that as well. But as I always say, I love you guys with all my heart. Peace.